All right, in the previous video, we talked about ubiquitin. And we saw that when a protein is damaged in any way, eventually it will be what we call ubiquitinated. And what that means is that an enzyme, which we'll talk about here, which is actually ubiquitin ligase, is going to attach multiple ubiquitin proteins onto the damaged protein. And ubiquitin ultimately, or multiple ubiquitins that is, serve as a sort of signal that tells the cell that this protein is damaged and it needs to be destroyed. And hopefully what you can see here down at the bottom left, which is what we talked about in the previous video, is that the substrate, which is an enzyme, or a protein, depending, is actually going to be polyubiquitinated, meaning we're going to attach multiple ubiquitin residues onto what is going to be a lysine residue of the protein that is damaged, or enzyme that is damaged. Okay? And then those, that polyubiquitin tail signals to what we're going to talk about in the next video, video a proteasome, to degrade the protein and ultimately destroy it, recycling it, so to speak. Okay, now ubiquitin ligase technically is this E3, but in order to attach ubiquitin onto the damaged protein, we're actually going to need three separate proteins that are all part of the ubiquitination mechanism, um, but only ubiquitin ligase is E3. The other two are obviously going to be E2 and E1. And so what we'll see right now is how ubiquitin gets attached onto the substrate, which is the damaged protein. All right, so enzyme 1, or E1, has a cysteine residue, as you can see down here on it. Ubiquitin, which has a carboxyl group on it, is going to be adenylated. That means that on this carboxyl group, we're going to attach an adenosine monophosphate. That's going to drastically activate the ubiquitin and ultimately facilitate the cysteine attachment to it. And whenever that attachment occurs, we get the loss of that adenosine monophosphate, and then the initial reaction releases a pyrophosphate. So ultimately what this first reaction does is it attaches the ubiquitin onto enzyme 1, which is not the damaged protein. Okay? But now what's going to happen is enzyme 2 is going to come along, and it also has a cysteine residue. And essentially what's going to happen is the ubiquitin moiety is going to be transferred from E1 to E2 meaning E1 lost the ubiquitin, and now E2 has it on an identical cysteine functional group. Okay? Now, enzyme 3 is the ubiquitin ligase. Now, the substrate that we're talking about, so the damaged protein or damaged enzyme, has a lysine residue on it. Lysine, remember, it's R group has a nitrogen or a mean at the end, and essentially what's going to happen is E3 is going to facilitate the transfer of that ubiquitin protein onto that lysine amine. Okay, so you see here enzyme 2 has the ubiquitin, but over here after the last step we see the ubiquitin is transferred onto that amine. Okay, and that actually forms an amide bond to the ubiquitin protein. Now that would be referred to if we just went from uh, the substrate, which is right here, to this one ubiquitin. That's called monoubiquitination. Okay. However, we don't just typically attach one ubiquitin, we attach multiple ones. So we're going to need to repeat this whole process, that's why you see these, this dashed arrow, it's multi-step. And we're actually going to attach a lot more than just four. Um, there's going to be many, many, sometimes into the hundreds of ubiquitins that are polymerized exactly in this fashion. Okay? And also one thing to know is that the ubiquitin has a, has a, a lysine residue as well. So what we said is the substrate here with the lysine residue, when we attach the next ubiquitin, there's also going to be a lysine residue off of this, which is where the next ubiquitin is going to be added um, to form the next amide linkage. Okay? Now the question is, why do we have to use an ATP here initially? Well, we're going from what is a carboxyl group right here to an amide. Okay, and in terms of free energy, that's not a favorable transition going from a carboxyl to an amide. So in order to go from the carboxyl group to initially the thioester, which is largely unstable and high in energy, we have to split the ATP somehow to release that free energy, and that allows us to ligate the ubiquitin onto the carboxyl group to make the thioester. And then we're going from a thioester to another thioester, which is it's not really any change in free energy. And then we're going from a thioester to an amide, which is actually downhill in energy. That's more of an exergonic reaction. 
But the reason that we have to use the ATP is we're going from a carboxyl to an amide. Ultimately, that's the net reaction. And then we're going to take that damaged protein and polymerize ubiquitin onto it. And that's called polyubiquitination. And this molecule right here, which is very large at this point, it's a damaged protein with an amide linkage to multiple ubiquitins. These ubiquitins signal to the cell that this is a damaged protein. And so we're going to see in the next video that there's a very large protein complex called a proteasome that's going to break apart this substrate, this damaged protein. And we want it to be broken apart because it's damaged. We don't need it anymore. We need to recycle the amino acids, and then we can build new proteins if we have to do that. Okay? And so in the next video, we're going to hopefully learn about proteasomes. But this is the mechanism of ubiquitin ligase and, in general, ubiquitination. And just understand we're going to polyubiquitinate the damaged protein, and then the proteasome in the next video is going to degrade that damaged protein. All right? So make sure to like this video and join us in the next video when we talk about proteasome structure and function. Thank you.